My name is Link Strait. I'm the Chief of Police for the Arvada Police Department. I want to share some of the facts as they relate to the terrible tragedy on Monday, June 21st in our community. Being respectful of the ongoing investigation, I feel transparency with our community is critically important. We lost two heroes on June 21st, and we need to respect their memories and their loved ones. The event takes place here in the Old Town Nevada neighborhood. At approximately 1.17 p.m., a teenager calls 911 about a suspicious person near the Arvada library who was making quote, weird noises and showed them a condom. And the person in question was described as a white male in his 40s to early 50s. This is when Officer Gordon Beasley was dispatched at 1.30 p.m. and began patrolling the area around Old Town Square searching for the man a minute later at 1.31 p.m. In the Town Square Professional Building located here, diagonally from the library, were three other officers, Officer Brownlow, Haw, and Boom. They were there for an unrelated reason catching on some paperwork in a police administrative office and were not wearing their standard police uniform, just a polo shirt with fabric badges and shorts, but all three officers were still equipped with a handgun and standard duty belt. Four minutes later at approximately 1.35 p.m., 40-year-old Johnny Hurley was walking into the Army Navy surplus store, ready to shop that's located here across the library. Moments before John had walked in, 59-year-old Ronald Troike parked his truck in the alleyway next to the library and he had one goal in mind, kill as many Arvada police officers as possible. As Ronald is parking, you can see Officer Beasley walking here. Immediately after Ronald puts his truck in park, he exits out of his vehicle and runs towards Officer Beasley, equipped with a 12-gauge semi-automatic shotgun. He yells out, hey, at Beasley, grabbing his attention and fires at the officer two times as he turns around. He then fires at nearby police cars. The three officers heard the sounds and couldn't figure out exactly what it was. They didn't receive anything via radio, nor did they check the surveillance video so they assumed the sounds were either coming from maintenance inside the building or someone banging on the door located on the east side, and this was more of a logical answer as this was a common occurrence. Officer Boom headed to the back door to see if someone was knocking, and this is when he saw Ronald near the dumpsters holding a weapon. He saw Ronald through the door window and realized that the sounds they heard were gunshots. He thought about confronting Ronald, but he knew his soft armor and the door wouldn't be enough to protect them from Ronald's weapon. He was worried that he was seen by Ronald as he was glancing at their direction, but he didn't. Ronald then turns around and began walking back to his truck. Officer Boom aired via radio that there was an active shooter and described the shooter's outfit. Officer Brownlow then took over to look through the door window while the other two went to other vantage points. On the other side, Johnny quickly recognized the sound of gunshots and immediately runs outside. According to witnesses, Johnny was yelling at everyone to stay inside. He points where the shots came from yelling out, he's got a gun, and immediately pulls out his legally concealed 9mm handgun. As Johnny runs near to where Officer Beasley was killed, Ronald walks back to his truck swapping to an AR-15 from his passenger seat. As he's doing that, Johnny is taking cover behind a brick wall. He patiently waits for Ronald to get closer, and once he's close enough, Johnny points his weapon at Ronald and shoots at him six times. Five out of the six shots hit Ronald. Ronald collapses on the floor, still alive. As Johnny runs towards Ronald, he removes the AR-15 from him and unloads it all while holding the rifle pointed towards the ground. 
but without any warning, John is shot by Officer Brownlow. He fired three times but only one struck Johnny. He was hit near his right hip and collapsed on the floor at 1.37 p.m. All of this happened in just two minutes. Craig Brownlow saw Johnny holding Ronald's AR-15 and his handgun. He couldn't tell if Johnny was reloading or trying to fix something and suspected that he was possibly a second shooter. They still weren't aware that one of their own was just killed a minute ago. For 11 seconds, he saw Johnny holding Ronald's weapon, proceeded to come outside and shot Johnny without warning. Paramedics were aiding Johnny at the scene and eventually took him to a hospital where he was declared dead shortly after he arrived. His autopsy report shows that the bullet severed an artery and never exited his body. His manner of death was homicide. Sir, we have an incident in progress, 7525 West 57 Avenue. Three people down, shots fired. Stage out of the area. In progress. Time to two copies. We have an active shooter in Old Town, Nevada. Copy. I'm going to get some, uh, three ambulances started. That's affirmative. Well, medics, uh, they're asking for you to get your tactical gear on. Units responding, we do have a request for an ambulance to Grandview and Grant. I don't know if that scene is secure at this location. Medic 51, uh, Battalion 52, I uh, need you uh, on the just north of 57th and uh, Old Watt. Uh, we have uh, Officer Down. This area is code 4. We have two more patients down in that room. We need two ambulances to 57 and Wadsworth. Confirm, sir. You have an ambulance to Grant and Watts. That's an officer. Three patients, uh, one deceased. We both are down here in the alley, just north of the library, north of the library. And units responding, we have two, two suspects. Two suspects with guns, one handgun, one AR-15. Okay, let's get in a secure location, guys. One, one, three, two, Adam. We got uh, two prone. Where are we at? What's crossfire? Where's the other suspect at? Do not respond to the east. Okay. Copy, do not respond. Do not respond for me. We're gonna get hands on this guy right here. If he moves with it, you cuff him, then we're gonna get associated with that. Hey! Chris! You and you! Watch that guy! We're gonna get him to get this guy! Who's with me? I'm with you. Okay, I need you to go hand. You get, a, you get the eyes on him. Okay. Put it on him. Guy in the red. Don't, don't fucking move. move! Don't move! Don't move! Don't move! You wanna watch black? I got red. Got it. We have medical coming in from the east. Can you confirm that they do not want us to come in from the east? Okay, that's that any moment from that guy. Negative. One half med one coming into the area. Mike, you gotta come up here. Mike, get up there, turn away. Mike, throw him on his stomach. Stand by, stand by. Just wait. Just stay behind us because we're going to lose a couple of that. I need a lot of jumping around as well. 1342. 
Anything else on him? Okay, animal, we need to go secure this guy. Mike's got hands. Mike's got hands. I, no, PJ, you go hands. You come out, I'll go hands with you. PJ looks pretty sure. PJ, take the Don't left. move. Take the left. Secure it. Secure that side. <laughs> Don't move, Tish. Stay where you are. Are you involved in this? Don't move, Tish. Check the phone. I'm behind you, Tish. You have a gun. Okay. Contact that one I'm at. Singers and Ralston, where are they? Is there at? anyone else involved in this that you know of? All I know is north side of the library. Okay. Anybody else can get me to the guy? Hey, Sarge, we got someone else on the phone. One left, you were in the alley between the library and the Century Link building. Just stack up behind us. Okay, stack up. On your stomach, crawl out in front of us. Yeah. Just crawl out. Do not reach for anything. Gun in his hands, guys. Look at this. He's got a phone. Okay, this one's gone. DJ, you're in charge of him. We got one. We need to close that off if that's not closed already. I need to clear this. We have any more immediate threats, anybody? Who is the RPI? We call this in. I'm still trying to gather all that information. The alleyway. I just want to see if there's anybody. Hey. So we got two civilians in here. Down? No, safe. Okay. okay. One shooter, two shell cases. Okay. Who's. You maintain security here on this door? Um, I, I think you all want to, I think we need to secure you. Yeah, yeah you yeah. need to go. I'll stay here. Okay. You go. I can take you back to my car. I'll just walk back. Yeah. Hold on, is he a, is he involved? Yeah. Okay. Why don't you, I will take care of you real fast, okay? okay. Come with me. Okay. Brown low. Paul. There we go. Okay, why don't you go grab your uh, car, uh, find access along here and control, make sure, take a look at the perimeter and see what else we need. I'm asking you to go take a look and see where else we need to put people. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where we're at. Hey Mitch, put your car right over here, please. Is this you? Confirming your wanting three two to show down to the box. I'll put his weapon right here. Huh? Alright, that's his weapon right there. You're walking away. We we pull up right here mm -hmm. uh -huh. and we follow officers running down this alley. Okay. And right away there's two two down. Okay. And who what agency was that? That was Arvada. Okay, that was Arvada. It was all, all Arvada. So okay. We assisted them um, covering them while uh -huh. they cuffed them up. I guess they were both deceased. And I, I picked up. Suspect? 
I think so. Spirit put him wherever. He missed where Spirit went because then we were checking the area. I, the dude that was alive, I grabbed his AR okay. and secured it in Sperry's, back of Sperry's car. And he was a suspect. Yes. Okay. Both of those guys were suspects. Okay. And one was clearly deceased. One. Then Nanette, Nanette and I, we cleared this like uh, back to these businesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when we heard commotion over here and just kind of hung out over here while. You want to point me to find research? The corner. Mm -hmm. A bunch of Arvadas there got two at gunpoint. One of them still moving. They, they wanted somebody to we call back because they're they coming off the state highway. And we thought there was a third one over here, but I guess there's not. I guess there's only two. What are we? Hold it for 30 seconds until I get to a place there's where one I can cop down, the phone Yeah. Where is the camera? I don't know. Not a clue. That's probably where I need to go. Patrick, can you please transfer that to my Was that our Vata PD that's down? Yeah. And then, do we know about how many? Gordo? I don't know. Do we know how many civilians were killed? I don't know that anywhere. Okay, good. I was I was told where there's a total of three down. The one I transported out of here, dead guy and deceased officer on the far side of the courtyard. Right over here. Yeah, right over here. So there is a deceased officer. Just less than five minutes away, SWAT team arrived at the apartment complex Ronald resided in. SWAT members entered at a neighbor's apartment for cover and told him to go to the back room in case there's any altercation. They managed to break into Ronald's home and found a four-page handwritten note which one of them was titled Sociopath Sovereign Citizens and another titled Sovereign Citizens that was taped on his bedroom wall. Just a quick note, few words have been blacked out. I didn't edit the note, this is how I found it. The note reads, So you found my place. I knew you would. If I could have rigged this place to explode, I would have. No bomb making knowledge. Final thoughts for now. The corruption among law enforcement agencies across the country is unbelievable to me. Having people to enforce law and that break those same laws that they enforce and are not held accountable. You are the worst people to have. It's been that way forever. The people have had enough. Do you understand? Aurora PD seems to be the troubled police agency in Colorado. So once again, I dedicate what I did to Aurora PD especially those officers involved in the killing and mooking of Elijah McLean. Also, the drunken pig. My DUI changed my life. No accountable, the way it's always been. I also dedicate my actions to Aurora PD officer. Another coward pig. I see you cops do all the things to people you don't want done to yourself. Fuck you people and die. Now for the other page titled Sovereign Citizens. Did you get the message the officers I encountered in front of the library in Old Town? Should have taken me more seriously if they thought that was funny. I hope they're still laughing. Do you understand, Sovereign Citizens? My goal today is to kill Arvada Police Department officers. I dedicate the killing of APD to Aurora PD since they're in the limelight. I've been fooled most of my life as to really what kind of people you really are and I've came to a conclusion. You government people, you sociopaths that wear that badge and those we never see that work. Behind the scenes, you are exactly the same people you arrest. Do you understand, sovereign citizens? There's a community of law enforcement across the country and in that community of law enforcement of what I thought were special people. You have rapists, pedophiles, drug dealers, murderers, thieves, child molesters. Many of you are the same people you arrest. Some of the worst of the worst human beings are police officers and those who oversee all their wrongdoing. You are the biggest group of uniformed cowards in the country. You have the thinnest skins and weakest minds. We the people were never your enemy, but we are now as you can see here today. You brought this on yourself. You pigs are out of control. Around the country, no one gives a shit what you do or how you do it. So this is what you get. You are the people that are expendable. 
Not us. You pigs have ruined thousands of lives during my lifetime and many more before I was born. For this, hundreds of you pigs should be killed daily till you get it right. Today, I will kill as many Arvada officers as I possibly can. Female officers and young pigs. I want the families of these officers to feel the pain you pigs dish out so freely and easily on a daily basis. There's so much more to say, but I'll leave it at this. Today, I will die. I will be a hero in the eyes of millions for killing pigs. I did what I did because I believe what you pigs get away with. Instead of being the best people there is, you pigs are the worst. Die. Fuck you. And just one more thing. I don't know how this will turn out, for I should be dead. When this is over, I just hope I don't die without killing any of you pigs. I didn't have much going on in my life to die early. Since we all die, I guess it can't be all that bad. Even though I know I'll be against a small army, I hope I did well. Fuck you pigs and die. I'll be back. And that is all that was written in his four page note. As for the DUI that he mentions, I found that Ronald was arrested twice in his lifetime. One in 1992 for third degree assault and the DUI he mentioned was in 1994. Another item found in his apartment was his Samsung tablet, which contained several videos of Ronald manipulating slash walking with handguns and a rifle. There were also pictures of his AR-15. His YouTube history was filled with almost nothing but anti-police, police misconduct, and First Amendment videos. The recording of him yelling at police officers just outside the library in Old Town Square was also in his tablet. One of the officers Ronald was yelling at was Officer Brownlow. This recording occurred just two weeks before the shooting on June 7, 2021. His last Google search was asking if he could be criminally charged for flipping off or cussing at police officers. You'll know it when I ask you for it. I'm gonna film you guys, okay? Okay? Because you're sovereign citizens. That's why I'm filming you. Every movement a sovereign citizen makes, every word they speak needs to be filmed. Because you guys are terrible people, man. Not all of you are, but there's too many that are no good, so we have to assume all of you are bad. Yeah, I figured that would be fine. Don't speak to me, man. No more conference. That don't mean nothing. Everything disappears. You guys don't have body cams. Why is that? Are you guys special? No, no, we're actually in the works of getting them. Yeah, well, you, you, you've waited too long for that, okay? You're sovereign citizens. There's no better way to explain a police officer. You are sovereign citizens. I've seen it with my own eyes. You do all the things to people you don't want done to yourself, and we're supposed to appreciate your kind, right? No, I know not all of you are bad, but there's too many that shouldn't be a police officer. Okay, and if you don't agree with me, you're brainwashed. A lot of these are brainwashed. What, what have I done today? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to FOIL that. If that's your personal phone, is that, a, is that a company? I'm going to FOIL request that, okay? About an hour before the shooting, Ronald called his sister crying, making suicidal statements. He was saying, I can't do this anymore. Take care of yourself. I'm sorry. She also mentioned he complained that police didn't take him seriously, which was mentioned in his four-page note. His sister would then call Ronald's brother to inform him about her concern with Ronald's mental health. His brother states the following. My sister said that he's been watching all of this YouTube stuff and all this constant negativity about the police and the negative things that they do and this and that. He gets up early in the morning and calls my sister up and tells her about all this negative police stuff that YouTube always shows and all the lies and crap they give out and he just kept watching it and watching it. And so I think this is part of it. He also adds that Ronald became a loner since their father died back in 2015 and hasn't spoken to him in years as he began isolating himself at home. When Ronald's brother was informed, he calls requesting a welfare check at 12.49 p.m. The officer who went over to check on Ronald was Officer Beasley himself. He was dispatched to Ronald's apartment but failed on locating him as Ronald was already at the Old Town Square causing a disturbance at 1.08 p.m. Yes, Ronald was the suspicious person from earlier. His plan was to cause a scene to lure police to the area and ambush them. And as we know, his plan unfortunately worked, taking the life of one officer.
When police first arrived at the scene in Old Town, Johnny was considered a suspect. However, thanks to the many witnesses, they were labeling Johnny as a hero and the Good Samaritan for stopping an attempted mass shooter. Arvada's mayor, Mark Williams, says that day was the hardest day of his life as a mayor. We still mourn the loss of Officer Gordon Beasley and are so thankful for the service of the Arvada Police Department and at the same time we still think about Johnny Hurley. It's tragic because of the actions of a crazed gunman, we lost two very good men that day. Arvada's police chief, Link Strait, had come out the next day labeling Johnny as a hero and that he likely disrupted what could have been a greater loss of life. An employee at the Army Navy surplus store said that Johnny never thought twice when he first heard the gunshots. He was inside the store for about 5 seconds before hearing the gunshots and ran outside. People were grateful of Johnny's heroic action because no one knows what could have happened to them had Johnny never intervened. Johnny's sister, Erin Hurley, got the news hours later around 8pm that night and was only informed that Johnny was shot and killed, but no other details were given to her or his mother until 4 days later. Both Erin and Kathleen, Johnny's mother, were at the police station in Wheat Ridge with 7 people including the police chief and city's public information officer. Erin says quote, and Then they got to Johnny and it was all this talk about how he stepped in, how he stopped it. They use the word hero, and then they're told that Johnny was killed by an officer. Both began crying and Aaron angrily stated, Not one person said to my mom that they were sorry. I couldn't believe it. A fucking cop killed my brother. Neither Aaron or Kathleen were told that there were three officers in the area that day and that it was one of those officers who shot and killed Johnny. Not until a few months later on November 8, 2021, when District Attorney Alexis King released a document containing details of what happened and that she declines on filing criminal charges against Craig Brownlow. Dear Chief Strait, The 1st Judicial District Critical Incidents Response Team has completed its investigation into the June 21, 2021 fatal shooting of John Hurley by Arvada Police Officer Craig Brownlow in Old Town, Arvada. After a thorough review and analysis of the evidence, I find that Officer Brownlow's use of deadly physical force was legally justified to defend himself and others from the perceived threat posed by John Hurley. Given my conclusion, no criminal charges will be filed against Officer Brownlow. Because Officer Brownlow's objectively reasonable belief that a lesser degree of force was inadequate to resolve the imminent threat posed by what he reasonably believed was a second mass gunman. And because Brownlow had objectively reasonable grounds to believe, and did believe, that he and other persons were in imminent danger of being killed or suffering serious bodily injury after hearing many gunshots, shooting John Hurley was legally justified despite his heroic actions that day. No criminal charges can or should be brought against Officer Brownlow under Colorado law. One thing that became evident throughout our review was that John Hurley that day acted as a hero. Had he survived, we would have praised his, ba his bravery in engaging a mass shooter before anyone else was killed. He acted defend to defend others, and we will remember him for his selflessness. We've dedicated hundreds of hours to evaluate the incredible decision made by the officer to engage John Hurley. And we hope our decision not to file charges will bring a small piece of closure to those affected. And that in this finality, there is some healing. As you can imagine, Johnny's family was hurt by the decision and his mother came out saying, quote, 
I imagine that many people are angry, and that is understandable. I would ask that instead of acting out on your anger, that you use that energy to be the change you wish to see in the world. Engage in meaningful conversations that might make a difference in how we all may move forward together. I pray none of us will have to face a situation such as Johnny did, but as we pull ourselves together to move forward in life, consider using Johnny's commitment to doing the right thing, even at the greatest cost to inspire your own actions. His family has set up a GoFundMe to pay for his funeral cost and managed to raise $92,000. As for Craig Brownlow, he has been on paid administrative leave since the day of the shooting and at the time there was no telling if he was going to return as a spokesman for the Arvada Police Department said it was all up to him. Arvada Police Department still told him that he was able to return whenever he'd like to. Things would go quiet from here until the following year on June of 2022. On the 22nd of June 2022, Kathleen had filed a civil rights lawsuit against Craig Brownlow and Arvada Police Chief, Link Strait. The lawsuit alleges that the three APD officers handled the situation poorly by not responding properly and taking action the moment they recognized the danger. It also alleges that Brownlow had failed to present himself to Johnny while he was holding the rifle in a low ready position. He only presented himself after he shot Johnny. The lawsuit reads, Unlike Mr. Hurley, the three APD officers did not spring into action. Rather, they cowered inside, choosing self-preservation over defense of the civilian population. APD officer Craig Brownlow later explained that he thought Mr. Hurley might have been the active shooter, but no reasonable person could mistake the two men because of their very different body types and clothing. For approximately 11 seconds, Officer Brownlow watched Mr. Hurley removing the magazine of the rifle while he holstered his own concealed carry pistol. Officer Brownlow had the time and opportunity to carefully assess Mr. Hurley's actions. Because Mr. Hurley was stationary, hunched over, had the rifle pointed down, was not making any verbal threats, and there was no third persons in the vicinity. Officer Brownlow considered whether to issue any warning, but instead, finally feeling safe enough to leave his place of hiding, Officer Brownlow opened the door and fatally shot Mr. Hurley from behind without providing any warning. Officer Brownlow later explained that he made a deliberate and intentional choice not to provide Mr. Hurley with warning or command, but he made this deliberate choice despite knowing that Mr. Hurley was not the active shooter whom Officer Brownlow had earlier identified and he made this choice despite the fact that no reasonable officer could have perceived the threat from Mr. Hurley's actions. Mr. Hurley's death was not the result of a misfortunate split-second judgment call gone wrong, but the result of a deliberate and unlawful use of deadly force. Had Officer Brownlow attempted to resolve any of the incongruities in his observations, or had he reasonably assessed the level of threat, or had he announced his presence with a few short words, the Arvada community could have celebrated Mr. Hurley instead of mourning his loss. I've read the transcripts of all three interviews of Brownlow, Hall, and Boom. Both officers Boom and Hall admitted that they weren't confused by the two men. Officer Boom had told investigators, quote, I hate to say it, but the guy in the red shirt is not the guy I saw with the AR-15. The guy with the AR-15 was wearing black and my immediate thought was the shooter is still out there. When Johnny was removing the magazine from the rifle, Brownlow explains that to him, Johnny looked like he was manipulating or reloading the rifle. He continues to explain that he first saw Ronald by the dumpster area, then he lost sight of Ronald once he was heading back to his truck. Brownlow did manage to see him for a while as Ronald was returning with his AR-15, but then lost sight of him again. 10 seconds later, he hears more shots, which were the shots fired from Johnny's handgun. Brownlow claims that the sound of Johnny's gunshots sounded the same as the shots from Ronald's shotgun. He even states here that it was louder than a handgun. Brownlow wasn't able to see the killing of Ronald from his point of view, as parked vehicles, bushes, and the trees were in the way. 
but later sees Johnny holding the AR-15, watched him for 11 seconds before proceeding to step out and killing Johnny. He did say that at first he thought about yelling at Johnny, but because a handgun versus a rifle isn't fair, he didn't think he had any chance so he proceeded to fire at him because he saw this as an opportunity to finally end it. Other reasons he gave were that Johnny would have had a chance to run and take cover, or that Johnny would have fired at him or other people in the town square area. When he steps outside alongside with other officers, he says, in my mind, either the man in red was the man in black or there's another shooter. He later says that once he notices both Johnny and Ronald, that he was happy that he ended it because this is what he was trained to do. When asked who did he think those two men were, he responds with, well, in my head, Beasley shot the guy in red and I thought there were two shooters. Literally the name Klebold and Harris came in my head when I saw that. As for Chief Linkstraight, the lawsuit alleges that he is responsible for approving the unlawful policies and poor training that ultimately led to Johnny's death. At all times relevant, Defendant Chief Strait was acting in his capacity as Chief of Police employed by the APD and was responsible by the oversight, supervision, discipline, and training of the officers employed by the APD. Chief Linkstraight is the highest ranking police official in Arvada and responsible for Arvada's policies and training. Chief Strait has approved a deadly force policy that is unconstitutional on its face. Arvada's policy permits deadly force when an officer believes it's necessary to defend himself or a third person from the imminent use of deadly physical force. However, Arvada's deadly force policy explains that imminent does not mean immediate or instantaneous. Accordingly, Arvada's deadly force policy lowers the threshold for when its officers may use deadly force. Contrary to the constitutional standard, Arvada officers may employ deadly force even when the suspect does not pose any immediate threat to the safety of the officers or others. Under Chief Strait's guidance and approval, Arvada compounds its unlawful deadly force policy by training its officers not to provide verbal commands during any active shooter situation. These are just the highlights of what the lawsuit is about, but if you want to read the whole thing yourself, I will link it down in the description below. However, I do warn that the images are uncensored, so be aware that you will see Officer Beasley's body. So please take that into consideration before proceeding. The lawsuit is still going and there's really no telling how long until we have a conclusion. I cannot find any updates past June of 2022. Something I want to bring up is how Johnny was able to keep his composure the entire time. That's because Johnny had been trained for situations like this. Him and his sister enjoyed watching the channel Active Self Protection here on YouTube and decided to take courses on what to do during an active shooting. The training clearly paid off as he did stop an active shooter from possibly killing more and some of the witnesses first thought Johnny was possibly a police officer, ex-military, or a task force type of guy based on how he handled the situation. Johnny's training taught him how to disarm a weapon if the combatant is incapacitated to secure an area, which is why he grabbed Ronald's AR. It's important to bring that up since one of the many critiques towards Johnny was his reasoning behind grabbing the weapon. One of the witnesses, Mark Wise, saw the whole thing from beginning to end. He was one of the people that walked by Ronald before shooting Officer Beasley. He was hiding under a vehicle when he saw Johnny kill Ronald. He didn't know if Johnny was friend or foe, but something about his presence comforted him that he was going to be okay. What motivated Johnny to take active shooting courses was the fact that he simply wanted to help people and save lives and that is exactly what Johnny did here. In the small city of Arvada, everyone remembers both Hurley and Beasley. I only hope this video was spread beyond that.
He was a police officer, a friend, a musician, a cyclist. In addition to all of this, he was kind, he was caring, he was humble. He had a fundamental goodness to him that's all too rare. His goodness stood out from the rest so significantly that you would stop and ask, why aren't more people like Gordon? Gordon was an officer for the Arvada Police Department for 19 years. Before that, he was a drummer for a couple of years for multiple bands like the Rail Benders, Sponge Kingdom, and Brethren Fast. And Jim Dalton, the frontman of the Rail Benders, described him as someone who was just too good for this crazy world. Tommy Nahulu, a Denver muralist and local mainstay, said that Gordon was just a pure, warm-hearted, beautiful soul and stood out as someone who was genuinely nice. Another friend of his, Jennifer, said Gordon was a fantastic drummer and remembers watching him in awe whenever he played in Battle of the Bands. He was one of those deeply good humans with an open heart and a kind smile. He was the only reason I enjoyed chemistry class. Right before leaving the music scene, Gordon wanted to become a police officer and did in 2002. He endeavored to become the best cop and the best public servant that he could be. Gordon was a school resource officer for a few years and many students loved him. In 2016, he was on the news for helping a 7th grader, Micah, who was developmentally delayed. It all started when the student would casually talk to Gordon on campus and he discovered that the two enjoyed riding their bicycles. Gordon would contact Micah's mother and asked if he could pick him up and ride bikes with him and she said yes. Officer Beasley got a bike from Micah and began riding to and from school every Tuesdays and Thursdays. Another student noticed this and joined along. The city of Arvada was inspired by this story and Gordon was named Employee of the Year. The two rode together for two years before Micah was ready to graduate middle school. The city planted a red oak on Gordon's behalf. When Gordon passed, Micah said that Gordon was just like his dad. He was always there for me and always cared about me. His mother says they'll always be grateful for all what he did helping her and her son. And just before his final days, Gordon was notified that one of his former friend and bandmate, Mike Messina from Brethren Fast, was ill. One of Gordon's friends, Kathleen Kalbeck, posted on Facebook that on the day of his death, he called her making plans to visit Mike. His last words to her was, Cat, I have to go, I'll call back. A few days later, Mike passed away due to organ failure, making him the last member of Brethren Fast to pass away. Tommy Nahulu summarized Gordon with this statement. In the hysteria and madness and serious stupidity of the club scene in those days, Gordon outshined us all as a man. He just lived simply and presently. Of all the people I know, he should have been the one to outlive us all. Gordon was a brother, a son, husband, and a father. He leaves behind his wife and two children. He lived with the motto, look for the good in every day.
Johnny was a very protective big brother. Um, he always looked out for me, always made sure that I was safe, always made sure that I felt safe. Um, a lot of times when we were kids, he also said, the only one who's allowed to hit you is me. <laughs> of course, always in jest, but Johnny was very protective over him, over myself and my entire family. Johnny had a strong care for people. He enjoyed helping others more before helping himself. He was considered to be selfless by people who knew him closely. He was an activist who always wanted to make a change for those in need. He was part of the organization We Are Change Colorado, and one time, he had this idea of wanting to share love to people by simply going out and offering free hugs to people. A reminder that everything is okay. Johnny loved hiking, biking, fishing, dancing, cooking, playing music, and spending time with his family. Johnny had worked in kitchens since graduating high school. He enrolled in culinary school two years after graduating high school, and even though he was an amazing cook, he rarely made any money to survive, but it never bothered him because he simply loved what he was doing. He was described as an amazing chef, a hard worker who wanted to earn an honest living, respectful, and someone who always made the kitchen a better place. He took pride in his work and was always willing to learn to do better. He also took a side gig where he performed under the stage name DJ Johnny Verbal. But after the pandemic, Johnny lost his job as a chef and worked at odd jobs while still helping others. That's when he eventually got interested in taking active shooting training courses to be able to protect others and himself. Johnny went to the Army Navy surplus store to buy camping equipment as he and his sister Erin made plans to go camping together. That camping trip happened on what would have been Johnny's 41st birthday in August of 2021. Erin mentions that her family is small and with her brother gone, her family became smaller. A few months after her brother's death, she had the realization that once her mother's time is up, she will be burying her mother alone. Every month on the 21st, Erin sets flowers in the alleyway where her brother was killed. She also places a set of flowers at the spot where Officer Beasley was killed. Hey, what's up guys? Johnny from We Are Change Colorado. Hey, uh, just want to let you know that uh, even you can make a difference. Don't be fooled by the immensity of the issues that we face today. You are making a difference by standing up and using your voice. You don't have to sign a contract. If I could say one thing to my brother now, it's that I love you. <laughs> 